Hi, Seats, and welcome to the Maestro Online. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> We're very happy to have you. So, so Seats, you're um, a respected organist, you, but you're also respected for uh, your influence on organ education and improvisation. So not just as performer, but the whole package, if you like. Where did, where did it all begin for you? Well, for me, it started very early uh, in my early childhood. And now I'm talking about when I was four, three years old. We had a little organ at home, a little reed organ. And whatever music I could sing, little songs or whatever records we had at home that I liked, I would just try to copy that and to play it on the organ. So that's how it all started. And that is actually very important. Uh, later in life, I discovered that that's actually the right beginning of making music. Because, well, that's one of my uh, things, with what we will talk about later as well. How do you start actually making music? It shouldn't be just lessons with uh, very practical things that you have to exercise every day. No, it's just listening to music, having fun, singing songs, try to copy whatever you hear. So that's how it started with me. And then so, I had my first... Yes? So, so from the early days, you were rather sound to instrument rather than starting with a cymbal, rather than starting with a printer score from, from your very young days, you were starting with the sound and copying the sound. Yeah, definitely. It all starts with singing because everyone can copy something what you hear in singing. That's your yes. most natural instrument, so to speak. And yeah. then you can copy that to whatever instrument. I mean, you can do it with every instrument. You just copy whatever you hear. And that means you're developing your inner hearing and your understanding of music. So that's actually the main thing of music making. So obviously at the age of four or whatever, for you, it was fun. At what stage did you realize or did you have ambitions to develop it more than fun and more than a hobby? And you could see that it, you know, it was you. Well, I still always use the joke that I don't work, I only play. So for <laughs> me, it's still a lot of fun. But I got my first organ lessons when I was nine years old. That was kind of a rule in the Netherlands. First, you had two years of some theoretical training, which was not really that serious, but you did sing some songs and canons and, and did some rhythmical things. And, and then at nine, you were allowed to play the organ and to have lessons. But of course, I already could play the organ, so I wanted to show off to my teacher. I still remember in my first lesson with two hands and pedal, look what I can do. <laughs> and luckily, he was a very good teacher because he didn't know what to do with that, but he understood that it was very important to me. So what he did was he gave me, again, one of those methods, which I really hate still. Uh, today, I still hate methods. <laughs> uh, but of course, they're a good training material. So I had to do exactly what was on the paper uh, on my desk. I had to practice very hard. And if I played it correctly a week after that in the lesson, I could improvise all I want. But that was the rule. I could only improvise if I did my lessons correctly. And it was very smart of him because uh, you have to imagine I hated the exercises. I just wanted to play beautiful songs and, and melodies that I knew. And then you get this book with, well, everyone knows it, the wonderful melodies like... <laughs> yes. I remember, that's the first exercise and then with your left hand and then together. And yes. It, it's I'm, I'm quite sure that's not how Bach learned. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure, actually. But that's, of course, still the way that everyone learns. And it was all right. I mean, he got me from that first uh, learning how to read scores to uh, the, the little eight preludes and fugues. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to backtrack a little bit with something you said, which was really interesting. And you were saying that you had this preparation before your organ lessons, where you were away already um versed with canons etc is, is that from the kadai based movement has that influenced um the initial stages of education that you experienced probably a bit but it's not a, at the same level as what you see in hungary for example uh, in the netherlands it was a little bit better in my youth there was still a good education that you learned how to sing and indeed how to sing canons um, to have some nice uh, rhythmical exercises. And we did it always as a group of children, age six till nine. Yeah. And it was okay, but it completely disappeared. Uh, so nowadays you don't have any good education for children left anymore. So I really hope that will change because it is yes. very important. But in my youth, it was still quite okay. It was not a very high level because I still remember I, I found it very easy as a kid to, to do all yes. of that. 
Uh, and of course, you want actually to, to have some challenges for kids. They really like that. And yes, yes. Well, in, in my memory, it was just some simple songs, and we had some fun. And then, of course, we teached the, the teacher as well, and it was fun, but not really that serious. Was was solfege part of that education? Not. Really. Uh, we learned a few very basic things, like how to, how to draw a clef and things like that, but it was really very simple. Okay. And I'm convinced, uh, and that's what I like about the Kodai method, for example, that's already a high level, and children like that. When you give yes. them a challenge, they want to learn. I see it in my own kids as well. It's very important to give them something that they have to work for, because that's what they like. It's yes, not always... and often if you tell a child they can't do something, they'll do yeah. their best to prove that they can. Exactly, and they will still have fun. It's not like yes. fun is the enemy of, of learning something. It's a complete yes. uh, misunderstanding of how you can teach music, definitely. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, so you've, you've, you've got your teacher, and um, you're completing your, the studies you're set in, in order that you will be allowed to improvise. And then where does it go from here? <laughs> um, well, then we moved to the north of the Netherlands. Uh, my parents both come from the north, from Groningen, which is, by the way, and we will probably talk about that too, uh, the organ paradise of the world. We have the, the greatest density of important historic organs in a very small province in the whole world. So yeah. for me, that was really going to paradise. So I became organist on a nice organ in the church when I was 14 years old. I got some good teachers. I was allowed to start at the conservatory in Groningen at a very early age, when I was 15. That was also one of the things that was really nice. You could combine your high school development with some serious music making at the conservatory. It was new in those days. I'm actually not sure if it still exists in that way. Right. That's a nice combination because, well, I hated school anyway, so whenever I could get out, uh, yeah. I would take the, grab the chance. So I was at the conservatory a lot of time, every day almost, uh, learning a lot actually, because at that age, when you are 14, 15, 16, uh, whatever you take in, it stays you, with you. Yes, you're a sponge at that age. I have to admit, the pieces I learnt at that age are probably still the pieces I play the best. <laughs> yeah, same here, and also the music that you get to know. I became friends with a teacher at the conservatory who had all these records and CDs and yep. well, in those days on the little cassette tapes. Yes. Uh, I would copy whatever I could get my hands on. So all the Mahler symphonies, the Beethoven, you name it. I, I yes. really got to know them and I yes. still have the time to, to learn all that stuff. And that's so good because well, you probably have the same experience. There are quite a few musicians that only stay in their own comfort zone. That's the music they know. Yes. But outside of that, it's complete blank sometimes. And it's yes. so wonderful to get to know all the great masterpieces of the, the great composers. It teaches yeah. you a lot. Yes, I'm a huge Mahler fan. Absolutely. <laughs> well, same here. <laughs> So, so obviously from there, it moves towards your professional life. Mm -hmm. So, so, so t talk me through the beginnings of becoming the professional that you're known as now. Well, I once got a, a young colleague of mine, uh, he visited me and he asked me almost that same question, but actually a little bit more specific, like, how do you get famous? Uh, <laughs> of course. You don't, there's, there's bad ways as well as good ways to do that. <laughs> and infamous uh, is, is an option too, of course. Um, so I did my best for it as well. Um, but the thing is, of course, you don't work for that. If, if you're only going for getting fame and getting concerts everywhere, you have your focus completely in uh, the wrong direction. It's all about just developing your skills giving it your best at all times, which is very important. Um, I knew a colleague that was always very interested in playing the big venue, so uh, a beautiful cathedral with a big organ. He would study really hard and make sure it was a good program. And yes. then when he had to play in a little village, it was like, well, those hillbillies, they would recognize good music, so I'm not going to put in a lot of effort. And I think that's really the wrong way of going about it. You really should always give it your best, even when it's uh, music that you really don't like, or you have to accompany a terrible choir or things like that. You always give it your best. You make sure you, you do appear on time. You really live up to the expectations. Yes, it's and interesting, Ernstitzer, with uh, music therapy as well. And in fact, I was reading some research on um, care homes for the elderly the other day. Mm -hmm. And it was saying how good music is for Alzheimer's and dementia. But it, the research was saying that how good quality music making was. Uh -huh. And the same for music therapy, people with specific needs. 
was that it wasn't music alone wasn't enough quality music was what would get the best stimulation yeah of course i totally understand but even if you have to do things that well for example i have a wedding uh, next week uh, a good friend of mine and well she married uh, a guy that isn't at all into church music or organs so they had to yeah. make some kind of compromise what kind of service it's going to be so i'm actually playing some cold play as well uh, and actually as far as pop music goes i really like that it's not bad yeah. at all it's, it's kind of a vasakalia style with the same bass line all the time it's not that yes. difficult and um well it's not really the thing i want to do but she asked it and uh, she definitely wanted to have me as an organist, so I'm just going to make it work. And again, you do your best to make it as good as possible and then people will probably like it. And maybe even some people in church that normally don't listen to organ music will think, well, that was nice actually. I, 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 I had the same last weekend I played for a wedding in which I play in which the hymns, one of the hymns was by Madness and the other hymn was When I'm 64 by the Beatles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had the, exactly the same thing. So, so you obviously then go on to uh, more advanced um, organ studies and you find some esteemed uh, tutors on your journey uh, from, from your geographical location who, who obviously take your technique and everything further. Was yeah, that I'm... mainly learning pieces rather than improvisation then? Well, both. I was very lucky. Um, I had a very good teacher in Groningen called Wim van Beek. He was the former organist of the Martini Kerk. And he wasn't actually a great teacher. He didn't know that much about all the details of the music he was playing. But he was really a genius player. He could do anything. He had a perfect technique. And he had a very good ear. So he knew exactly how to handle certain types of music on his organ. So basically what always happened was I studied a whole week I had my lesson and he would say yeah that's a nice piece uh, let me have a look and then he would just shift uh, on the organ bench and play the piece without any prep whatsoever uh, perfect and then you had to pay attention what is he doing with his fingers which stops is he using and you, I learned a lot from that actually and especially his focus on having a very nice natural beat so even he had a, he had a great technique so even when he played very virtuous it was always sounding easy and quiet because the, the beat was always steady and within the beat he did the most wonderful things. But there was another teacher, Jan Jongepier, who was one of the greatest improvisers I think in the world, but always very modest and also just before the whole YouTube age that you can see and find everything on the internet. But he came to Groningen as well, exactly in the period that I was studying there. So I had my improvisation lessons with him and he told me one of the most important things when it comes to improvising um, we have nowadays the idea that improvising is something extra to literature. So yes. normally you play literature and as a little extra here is improvisation. And by the very idea of that, it should be different from literature, of course, otherwise it's not an extra. And he told me, well, that's, that's rubbish actually, because you can improvise in any style and actually it gets a lot better when it does resemble existing music because then it has some rules and then you can really make some effort to make good quality instead of just yes. being interesting as an artist and do whatever you like. Exactly. And, and I tell um, younger students, well, they're not always younger, but <laughs> students of mine, um, that this, in fact, is how people like Bach would have learnt. Because, of course, there's what oh. we know as partimenti now, that Mozart inherited these these standard sort of harmonic structures or devices mm. or relationships between melody and bass, and how you embellish them then becomes your piece and and there it's almost like we have a common grammar and we learn these rules of the grammar and then we use the vocabulary that we have and the grammar that we have to create a new sentence or a new conversation exactly and then it's wonderful when something new appears and new can actually be in an old style but it can also be really new that you have your own vocabulary and a new language almost that's fine if that all develops but it all comes from first learning the trade and really understand what you're doing. And well, that's why the comparison with a language is so good because it's the exact same process. How can you ever say something coherent if you don't master the language? I mean, the better you master a language and so the more control you have over the, the grammar, the vocabulary, everything, the more eloquent you can actually explain something to an audience and actually communicate with an audience. 
Yes. If you just say, well, I, I blabber some words that don't have any meaning, uh, but I'm very interesting and I'm a great artist, you have to like it. Well, I'm not so sure if people <laughs> like it. Uh, because yes. you're not communicating, you're just trying to be interesting. And it is a problem nowadays, I think, that everyone wants to be an artist and wants to be interesting, but not with the work that is actually acquired to make sure that you have something interesting to say. So within these studies then, were you therefore learning those common uh, patterns uh, that made a particular style in a particular era, in a particular country, and then, and then were you developing compositions in different styles, etc., based on understanding um, the, the nuances of the grammar for those different styles and eras and nationalities? Yeah, definitely. And of course, I learned the most by actually playing all the literature because you learn from the great masters. So the more I got yeah. to know differences between the composers, the different uh, eras in, in time, uh, the, the different styles, the more I automatically actually translated it to my improvisations. Yeah. So, for example, that's a, a life, well, ongoing process for life. If you study Bach, the perfection in voicing alone it's so wonderful that, that you can study that the rest of your life and getting better and better at it all the time without ever reaching the level of Bach, probably. Um, but that's so nice. You can always develop it further and further. But that's indeed what happened during my studies that I discovered, okay, I can improvise. And at first you do your own thing, like, well, what you learned from childhood on is basically what you do, the same as talking again. Yes. But then you learn that there are different languages and you can learn them too. And you can learn more difficult words. And you can actually learn how to make a good speech without being boring and not just shoot all the information in the first minute, but really make some interesting uh, chapters in what you say. And you learn how to compose as well, that you can not only read, but also write. And then you can externalize your thoughts and it gets better. And well, that whole process was during my studies. And also I started thinking about teaching uh, in that period because well, when you study at the conservatory, you have to teach some children and you actually take over some students from another teacher who then has to observe how you teach. And it was a very interesting learning experience for me because I discovered that all the children ate those uh, stupid exercises. Uh, so that's actually what that was not me, but every child ate it. Yes. <laughs> also, they don't study really very hard at home. Exceptions. Most children, they follow some lessons for like three, four years and then they just drop out. That's yes, not it, it becomes a club. Yeah, and actually they don't like it. They don't like to make music. And actually, I suppose they wanted to learn the organ or another instrument because they liked it. So what's happening here? That they just don't like it after a while. And part of it is, course, is of course, that yeah, you have to put in the work and no one likes to uh, do a lot of work. But the other side is that the teaching is so boring and not at all having uh, some kind of connection to the inner world of a child. That's right. I, I have a comparison for this that I use. I talk about watching The Simpsons and seeing Lisa Simpson playing the sax. Uh -huh. and, and you think, oh, that's really cool. I want to play the sax like Lisa Simpson. And then you go to a lesson, you've bought your sax, and then you're told which finger is C which mm -hmm. fingers to put down and then you're told to play notes for four beats and two beats and one beat and you sound nothing like Lisa Simpson and you're not focusing on the sound you're focusing on reading and the reason you wanted to play the sax was you heard her play the sax and you thought I want to sound like that <laughs> yeah yeah that's the perfect comparison because that's what happens all the time we all learn how to read notes we learn how to press the right button at the right time but we stop listening, we stop having fun, uh, we're actually yeah. not making music, and only the really good ones that have the stamina to go on and finally get to the point that it turns into music, that's the people you will find at the conservatories and they will develop further and become good musicians. But that's such a small percentage. And I think, uh, well, children love to sing, they love to make music, so we really should think about teaching again. And that's hard, of course. Uh, it, since we have all these methods, it's wonderfully easy to teach. You just have that method. You put page one in front of the child. You explain what, what buttons you have to press or what movement you have to make. Uh, and you tell them that little symbol on the paper, if you see that, this is the action you take. And next week you have page two and then page three and so on. And yes. Horrible. It has nothing to do with music, but it's easy for the teachers.
Yes. So try to change that, that you need a complete different uh, way of thinking for teachers. That's not easy, I think, but that's actually no. the thing I'm trying to change also with my students here in Groningen at the conservatory, not only the urbanists, but all the students, that they realize yeah, that they missed out on something when they were kids, right. and they have the opportunity to give that to the next generation. Me too. I think we're kindred spirits. So <laughs> I think we've covered you in improvisation now, and obviously... Um, if, if, if I was to ask why or how you've become so well known for your improvisation, apart from the amazing things you've done on YouTube, um, it's really because of the studies, because of the journey, because you started at a young age, because it's always been your passion and it's always been the thing that's excited you and made, and to you is fun. Um, and also very important uh, that I live in Groningen and that I had access from a very early age on uh, access to all the wonderful instruments here and that really shaped me into the musician I am and also yes. that I have this preference for uh, Renaissance and Baroque music is mainly because of those organs. Yes. I mean it's so wonderful whatever church you walk in here and I can just go by bike uh, to all those churches you will see a wonderful little church with a wonderful organ with all the carvings and everything and that always spoke to me very much so I'm also very much interested in organ building uh, because it's it's not only just a musical instrument it's a work of art as well it's wonderful to look at it's in a wonderful building and well the whole package actually is for me so important so one of the things I also do at the conservatory is just I almost force the students to just even in winter time and when it's raining just get on your bike and get to those wonderful churches and play those all because those are really the best teachers you can have. It's kind of the history. It's almost a time machine that learns you what they did in earlier days and you learn automatically the right technique. You learn how to listen to old beautiful sounds. You learn how to make a distinction between just a average sound or a really good sound and why do some stops mix and others don't. And that's so interesting to learn mm. and also a lot of schools all over the world that don't pay any attention to that. No. They just have their practicing apparatus at the school, uh, often a new instrument without any character or even just that ugly uh, if, if you're unlucky. And that's where you get your lessons and that's where you develop your, your hearing and your understanding of music. Well, yeah. a good instrument really makes a lot of difference. Yes. So finally, um, your also known for your influence on the education movement and i think we've already hinted at that um you are quite respected for um for influencing young organists for promoting uh the the organ as an instrument for exciting people about it and for putting your heart and soul behind um the next generation mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's actually not something that I really aim for, but it's just my passion. So that's yeah. what I do, and people pick up on it. And I'm really grateful that, especially abroad, uh, a lot of festivals, I'm always invited to teach as well. And I really enjoy that because the best thing that happens is if you start teaching improv and you see a few students, and there are always a few in every group, you can see the little light in, in their eyes like, whoa, I didn't know this, I can do this. What did I miss out actually on uh, as a kid? And, and then they start practicing and they have progress and, and suddenly you can see the difference that they start understanding music. And that's the same what I do here at the conservatory in Groningen with all students, so not only the organists, all the students have to learn how to play a keyboard instrument, but not with a method, not with scores. Scores are not allowed in the room actually. Yeah. Just by hearing, by understanding. And it's so wonderful if you see that development and well, since I'm passionate about it, uh, people will pick up on it, so it works. Yeah. Let's explore that. So we'll move to our next stage. Cesar Tafis, thank you very much for uh, being um, sharing your life uh, and passions with us on the Mouth Show Online. I enjoy it. I'm really grateful that you give me the opportunity to even reach out to more people. <laughs>